It is Wednesday afternoon, November 29th. We'll be picking up in chapter 29 of, of Genesis, of Bereshit, Genesis 29. We're going to go back to the beginning of it just as an overview, and then we'll pick up verse for verse. I'll tell you when I get to that point. But uh, having had a week off that feels like a month off, I wanted to just refresh our minds that Yaakov, Jacob, has started on a journey. And because he had the encounter with the Lord, he has picked up, he has light feet, as the idea is given in the Hebrew, and he is encouraged. I think his heart's a little lighter. He knows he is leaving the land of promise, but he knows he's going as God is directing. And we do know he's got a goal in mind. That's to get back to his family's home in Haran, uh, Mesopotamia area. He's going there to find a bride. That can't be totally disappointing to, I would say, a young man. But remember, he's in his 70s. He's not a 20-year-old. Uh, we see that he does arrive in Padan Aram, the area of Haran, near the Euphrates River. Remember, it was the people that were living probably east of the river. And he does arrive there safely. He stopped by a well. We saw that that well very easily could have been the well that, that was where the servant of Abraham's household found the bride for his dad, for Yitzhak. That this could easily be the same place that Eliezer stopped and prayed. And Rivka, Rebecca, came to the well. She fit the criteria, every detail perfectly. She was the godly choice for Isaac, and the servant brought her back home to Isaac. Now Isaac, instead of going sending the servant and bringing a bride back, has sent Jacob. Remember, he has left because Esau wants to kill him because Jacob got the birthright. So if he kills him, then he can have the birthright. And he's so full of anger, he just wants... To, to kill him also. So he's left for that reason, but I also think that uh, God was in control, that it was not that he would only work in one way by sending a servant, but he would work in this way now also. So Yaakov comes along this well. There's some sheep there already that are waiting for the time when they would all move the stone and water all the flocks at one time. So some of the shepherds that were there, Yaakov started to talk to them. And even though we don't hear that he stopped and he prayed in the same way that the servant did, we still know this was a divine connection because he finds out that he indeed is in Haran. He's in the area he's supposed to be asked if anybody knew his family, is it well with his family members. They said, not only is it well, here comes Laban, Laban's daughter, Rachel, Rachel perfect timing and so he excitedly is going to meet her and I think this is about where we left off that we see in this that even though uh, Yaakov had been made aware of the fact that they would move that stone at one time when all the flocks were there he's so excited to help Rachel to uh, meet and all that he's going to go ahead and move that stone anyway I don't think we had to move the stone I should have looked it up last time but let's pick up um, let's see let's jump in here in verse 7 where um, he sees that he's been told that this is Rachel coming in in verse 7 he says look it's still high day it's still the middle of the day it's not the time for the livestock the sheep to be gathered and, and to put into the folds for the night is the idea so he's telling the other shepherds, water the sheep and go, go, take them back out to pasture, pasture them. And they said to him, well, we cannot till all the flocks are gathered and they roll the stone from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. Uh, some of the shepherds and shepherdesses might have been young and unable to move that stone. Sometimes the stones were large enough. It took two to three to move them. The stones could have been over the top of the well to keep the water fresh, to keep it from... Um, um, what's to happen when it expires? It it dehydrates. It evaporates. evaporates. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. That uh, it could be for never or all of those reasons. But uh, Jacob, for whatever reason, he wants to meet Rachel by herself. Uh, could be he's full of emotion. Could be anything at this point. But we'll just keep reading our story and let it unfold. We don't know more than what 
the words give us here. Someday we'll get to ask these people in person. But while he was still speaking with the other shepherds, telling them, you know, water your flocks and go, Rachel, Rachel, came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. She kept the sheep. And again, no coincidental meeting. God's directed Yaakov steps to this well at this very time and has brought Rachel in at this very time. Now we see what's much on, on Jacob's mind because of the repetitiveness in verse 10. I'll read the verse to you and then we'll talk about it. When Yaakov saw Rachel, the daughter of his mother's brother Levon, and the sheep of his mother's brother Levon, Yaakov, Jacob, went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of his mother's brother, Levon. <laughs> okay, three times it's been stressed. This is his mom's brother, his uncle, mm. Uncle Laban, or Levon, <coughs> okay? So obviously his mother, his home, his family, this is big on his mind. He's not off gallivanting into a brand new future and cares nothing about his past. No, it, it's the family that he is connected to and is the family that he was sent to. So how does he respond as we move on? And I find my place again. Okay, so verse 11. Then Yaakov kissed Rachel, raised his voice, and wept. Now, this would be a, a demonstrative <coughs> expression of love. When you've met somebody who, who's dear to your heart because they are family, even though he hadn't met her before, he's just filled with that emotion. It wasn't anything improper, but he, he did show his emotions, uh, burst into tears according to the Hebrew, and it also could be that separation from his family and his loved ones, a bit lonely on, on the traveling, that it was just overwhelming to him when he was together with her. Now, of course, it didn't hurt that he liked what he saw. If you don't believe me, keep reading. <laughs> so, um, Yaakov, Jacob, verse 12, told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and that he was Rivka's son. And she ran and she told her father. Now, you may have relative, you may have brother in your translation. Actually, it's nephew. You know, we know that, that Jacob is the nephew of Laban. There's no question about that. The Hebrew uses a word for a close relative, and you have to discern which, you know, brother or nephew or whatever you have to, to observe. You know, we did bring this out last time because I remember tripping on it. It's so difficult for me to follow. Forgive me as I look at my notes. But because Isaac married Rebecca, okay? So we've got the mom and dad up here. Isaac married Rebecca. Rebecca was his first cousin once removed, okay? That made Jacob and Laban second cousins. So Rebecca, Jacob's mother, was also his second cousin. <laughs> okay, and I see the puzzle. Yeah, you find a chart. I couldn't find one that was simple enough to put up on the screen. If I do find some time, I will. Right now, just take my word for it because it gets a little more complicated. And there's my alarm to remind us to pray for Israel and the hostage situation. So pray in your hearts even now. Now, Laban, being the brother to Jacob's mother, he's also Jacob's uncle. And he's going to become Jacob's father-in-law. So by the time this is done, Laban is Jacob's second cousin, uncle, and father-in-law. Okay? <laughs> second cousin, uncle, and father-in-law. The uncle and father-in-law are easier to see, but that second cousin is in there when you get back to the earlier, um, the, their parent generation. Rachel was Jacob's second cousin once removed, since he and Laban were second cousins. So if they're second cousins, Laban's children are second cousins once removed. So even though she's the daughter of his uncle, um, even, even though that, she's also the daughter of his uncle, and that makes her a cousin. So Rachel's his cousin, his second cousin once removed, and will become his wife. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, did I totally I'm lose you all? all <laughs> if you need it later, I'll, I'll spell it out again for you. But just know they were related on many sides. If you've ever heard the song that he ends up being his own grandfather, that's about how we feel right now. 
but this is very much in the family. So Rachel's run home and told Laban, do we remember something similar in that? Yeah. Remember when Rivka went and told her, her brother and family about the servant? Now Laban is hearing once again, hey, we've got another family member from that family out there, you know, to the what west of us. And you have to remember Laban was blessed uh, in riches by the servant. Did he have that in mind again? Oh, hey, this is a wealthy family, and what blessing am I going to get? Who knows, but we do know what, a bit of what his character was like. So Laban heard the news about Jacob, Jacob, his sister's son. Now that could be enough right there. Wants to know about, more about his sister. How's life been for her? What's been going on? So he runs to meet him, and he embraces him and kisses him. Again, the, the normal greeting as was done then that day in that way. And he brought Jacob to his house. And then Jacob told Laban all these things. So he's catching him up and telling him about family news and probably hearing other family news You know that he'll want to share with them later on Laban's side. But uh, Laban's convinced by hearing all this and says to him, you certainly are my bone and my flesh. You certainly are my relative. You didn't just happen on a name and know, throw a name out. Mm -hmm. You know the family. You're part of the family, and you're obviously my relative. So in essence, it says, and he stayed with him a month. But in essence, he said, stay with me. Stay with mm -hmm. us. They would take relatives in. That, that was common in that day because if you traveled, you didn't get to go uh, to Motel 6. You had to you know, have a place to stay. Often family would take family in. So he, Jacob's staying with him now. Verse 15, Then Laban Laban said to Yaakov, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? That gives us the idea that a little time's transpired and Jacob's been doing things to help the family. We're going to find out a little more clearly what he has been doing. Um, Laban's saying to him, you, shouldn't, you should get something for your labor. So he says, tell me, what shall your wages be? What would you like me to pay you, Jacob, because you shouldn't just have to do all this to stay here. Now, here's how we know Actually, let me just tip my hand because it's a little ways down in this as we're reading it. But probably, no doubt, Jacob has been helping with the sheep. He would keep him close to Rachel, who had caught his eye, who he liked from the beginning, if not love at first sight. And so he probably was already working with the sheep, helping her. Would have made her job a lot easier to have a, a man and the ability that a man has. So that's... Very likely because we're going to see the deal that he strikes with Levon. So let's just keep reading. I think it's the best way to understand it. Verse 16. Now Levon had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel or Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in figure and appearance. Now when it says that her eyes were weak, in the Hebrew it says she was tender-eyed. The eyes of Leah were weak. Now, that can mean literally she wore glasses. that she wore glasses. It also could mean that she wasn't as pretty to look at. You know, they, whether we like it or not, there are those that are considered model beautiful and those that are considered less. That's just the world that we live in. And in the oriental um, way of, of um, looking at what they consider beautiful, like we could say Hollywood beautiful is blah, blah, blah. The oriental beauty in that day was to have deep eyes. There was a spark of life in those eyes. They were like eyes on fire, and that made them very attractive. So it could be that that's all she lacked was that she didn't have that kind of fire in her eyes and that kind of deep color. It could have been meant in that way. It, so literally it could be the eye coloring. It could be her physical appearance. It could be, you know, all that we are saying. But the very idea that they add on to it, um, that Rachel was beautiful in figure and appearance, this is giving us a little more depth of probably what we are looking at. In the Hebrew, it says she's beautiful of form, and she was face beautiful, well-favored. 
So it does sound like out of the two daughters, Rachel was what everybody considered, or the majority of people would have considered very beautiful, and Leah was lacking. Some have taken it to the point and said that Leah's assets were that she was compassionate and she had a sweet nature, but Rachel had outside beauty. Now, I don't see that follow through in the character of these two girls, so I'm not going to say I agree with it, but I throw it out there because we don't know definitively exactly what's being referred to. But I do tend to think that in the Oriental ways, Leia was not as appealing as Rachel was. Uh, but beauty is only skin deep, and we're going to learn far more about these girls on the inside as time moves on. But uh, we know that Jacob, right from the beginning, he was attracted to Rachel. We just, we know that. He wouldn't have grabbed and hugged and kissed and cried if, if uh, he hadn't had some sort of, you know, draw there. So, um, I'm looking for where I was again. Okay, I finished verse 17, verse 18. Now, Yaakov loved Rachel. So, enough time has passed. Even if it was love at first sight, he knows he loves what he's seeing. He, he's gotten, begun to get to know her, and he does have a love for her. Um, so since he loved her, he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Okay? Seven years. Why did he choose seven years? Because in the Jewish culture, if one was indebted to somebody, they owed them money or owed them for some reason. They could pay it off by working for them as an indentured slave. The longest it could be is seven years because every seven years was a jubilee, uh, not the, the big jubilee year that's every 50 years, but every seven years there was a setting free that if you had indentured yourself as a slave to someone to pay off a debt, you were allowed to go free. Now, that doesn't mean that it started when you started year one, year two, year three, but it was a constant cycle. So if you went into, and date, and date, and if you became a slave <clears throat> in year three, you'd work four years to pay off your debt. If you became a slave in year six, you'd only, pay, you'd only work two years to pay it off. But God told Israel, and this will come to Israel when we get to it, because obviously we're prior to law, but we see that there were effects in, in motion already. Uh, God did tell them, you don't look down on that person if it's going to be just a short time that they'll be your slave to pay off your debt. That's, that's okay. You allow that. You don't say, well, I'm not going to let you have that deal because I want six years out of you rather than one year out of you. No, you had to just accept it. So Jacob, no matter where that year of Jubilee was coming, no matter whether they were at the first year or the seventh year of it, he was saying, I'm willing to work for you the longest that I would possibly work as a slave for a debt. So I don't have a dowry to give to her. And rather than getting a dowry from her, whichever direction that would be, let me work for her. Let me be your indentured servant for seven years. Okay? Now, that would sound wonderful to Laban. He basically is now knowing he can get seven years of free labor. That's what he's being told. Doesn't matter about the year of Jubilee. Doesn't matter where they're at. He's going to have a, a hard-working hand, handyman for free. So, Laban likes this. And he said, hmm, verse 19, it's better that I give her to you than to another man. Stay here with me. Now, what does he mean by that? That, again, was culture. He'd rather give his daughter to someone in the family than to a total stranger because he's more sure how she'll be treated by a family member than by a total stranger. And that's still true with the Bedouins and the Druze and other Eastern tribes to this day. They'll marry in family, they'll marry in the clan, rather than let them go out because they feel like it's a better chance for them to have a good, a good life. Yep. So, Laban likes the deal, obviously. Mm -hmm. Better like I give her to you than to a stranger, I'll put it that way. So, verse 20, the deal had been struck. Yaakov served seven years, Rachel, and they seemed to him like a few days because of his love for her. Oh, that's sweet, isn't it? Okay, so, seven years have passed. 
we're moving along. They're moving faster than I am, but we're moving along. <laughs> and verse 21, Yaakov says to Laban, give me my wife, for my time is completed, that I may have relations with her. Give her to me, let me marry her, let, let us become a one, you know, a couple. Um, because I have worked that time, my time that I guaranteed was up. So, Laban, Laban, he hears that, he agrees. So, verse 22, he gathered all the people to place and he held a feast. Typical again. And the marriage feast typically would last seven days. That was custom. That was still custom in Yeshua's time and that's still custom as it goes on even today. Can I ask you a question? Is there also the custom to get the, uh, the groom drunk on purpose? <laughs> I was asked, is it also custom for them to get the, drunk, the groom drunk on purpose? Let me just say that at the festivities, there would be free-flowing alcohol, mm. and there would be revelry and, you know, living it up. Um, and unfortunately, drunkenness could become a part of that, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to say what I shouldn't say today, but there's a certain group that are ultra <laughs> that when they get together and they do their dancing telephone, if you've seen it, you see how they get to feeling pretty good. If you go to some of the Passover seders, rather than stay on track with the meanings, you'll see, you know, they like to celebrate. Let me put it in the, this vernacular. If you remember Fiddler on the Roof, all he's done is get his daughter engaged. They haven't even had the marriage in that ceremony yet, and they get pretty, <laughs> wasted that, I that movie game. I didn't understand that. <laughs> sometime we'll have to do that okay and i'll have to explain a few things to you but it, it did go along it was not out of the ordinary they they just they worked hard they played hard they celebrated hard. hard okay they partied hard. <laughs> they partied hard yeah okay so it also was eastern custom that the bride would wear a veil now Today, in Jewish ceremonies, you will see, and this is beginning to become a thing of the past because they don't even start, but if they do start with a veiled bride, you will see before that ceremony has ended, the groom has lifted the veil. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they say. They say that stems from what happened to Jacob. They're making sure it doesn't happen to them, that they get a good look at who they're marrying ahead of time. Whether that's... <laughs> How that, how the lifting of the veil became part or not, I can't tell you. I'm that not quite that old, but <laughs> it, it wouldn't have been like our little, you know, we have to not think with our Western minds, so and we have to not think in our cultures. But if you've seen, and it's not quite the right connotation, but if you've seen like the belly dancers, you do see how the, the materials are not sheer and not see-through, and they are layered, so yeah, you know. Um, and, and I could believe that the second time when, Ray, when uh, Jacob's getting married, he might have made sure. <laughs> and it could have gone on from there. Um, there are those who say, well, you know, he deceived his father. Now he's being deceived by his father-in-law, tit for tat. But I have a hard time with that because my God is not a God who does tit for tat and says, well, you did that, so you deserve this. I don't believe in karma. What goes around comes around. No. Can you make your circumstances better or worse by who you are and what you do? Of course. That's true on both sides. You can make them worse, worse, and you can make better, better. <laughs> but I see it when the girl but, comes around. It does, it does affect that. It, I see it. It, it. Sure, we can all point to circumstances where we can say, because circumstances beget circumstances. But I don't for a moment feel like this was God saying, you deserve no. this. <laughs> you, know, you did that, you get this. That's just, that's petty for my but God. But it's not God that does it, God lets it happen. Well, true, true. <clears throat> but even in that sense, I see us forgiven. I don't see the Lord saying to us, well, you did this, so I'm going to let this happen. Now, granted, he does say if you take yourself out from my umbrella of protection, you're going to get rained on. You yeah. know? So, yeah, there are, we do, consequences come out of our actions. I'm not saying they don't. But I don't believe that. If we reversed this and Jacob hadn't deceived Isaac, and he did deceive him by his appearance, you know, and all that, 
I still think this would have happened is what I'm trying to say. Just my point of view, but anyway, because uh, uh, all along I just don't see, there's so many times God's grace is just there in our lives. Well, you've got to realize again, think of the culture and the way it was, okay? So they have a ceremony where she's veiled, and then the next time that he, in essence, sees her, they haven't done what we do where they have all the festivities that are going on, where they, the couple even dance together in some of the weddings, where they're going as a couple to tables and greeting people, where they're side by side and interacting with each other. They have that kiss, you know, where they obviously have seen each other face to face. That's all our traditions. That's not their tradition. So he, he's, however short or long that ceremony was, when that ceremony ended, very likely the next time that he saw his bride was that night. Now they probably got married at sundown to begin with because that was the usual culture also. The work that was done in the day at sundown, they would have the procession out, they would have the ceremony, now it's dark. Now he goes into the tent and, and I'll tell you a little, well I'll, I'll bring it out here so I don't take away from our thought. If Laban is wanting to pull a fast one on Jacob, which we know he is because he's sneaking it in. If the two girls were similar in size, similar in appearance, he very likely would have taken Rachel's clothing, put it on Leah, if she had her own perfume or whatever that would make it seem like Rachel, and put her in the tent there's no lamps, folks. Yeah. There's, you know, they, they don't have, they're not exposing themselves for the moonlight and all the rest. They're in a dark tent. It's dark. He has had something to drink. He's feeling, you know, happy. He's worked seven years. He's getting the fulfillment of what he'd done. And in that darkness, if she stayed quiet, if her voice was similar, she wouldn't have to stay quiet. But if it was different, if she stayed quiet, he wouldn't have known, you know, and okay. things happen. And but <laughs> since they've never really touched a hug or a kiss. Beforehand, they didn't right. touch so, a kiss. So there wasn't a, a familiarity. Good right. point, good point. But, I mean, Rachel must have agreed to that because it doesn't say she said anything. Okay, do you mean Rachel or do you mean Leah? No, Rachel agreed to have Leah married first because she never objected to the fact that she Okay, that's an argument out of silence, because I'll ask you, did she object? Did her father lock her up somewhere, keep her away? Is she hollering bloody murder and nobody's around to hear? <laughs> Celebrations going on. <coughs> Leah, did she, by choice, go along? Was she glad to sneak in there? Yeah. Or was she forced? You know, the girls didn't have a whole lot of say. You know, nowadays, girls stand up to their dads and for better or for worse, think, uh, things Leah, can happen. She knew her defects. I think she was, if, she had if it was defects and if she had a crush on him, she could have gladly gone along yeah. with it. She could have thought, you know, this is my one and only chance. I'm going to jump at it. You know, don't know. Don't know. I think she had a, at least been willing to go along, if not by choice, choosing to go along, just because of what happens for the rest of the night. You know, I think she has to have, I think she had to have some feelings for him, I think. But I do wonder, I just can't imagine Rachel being willing. I think she had to have been confined. Just, you know, just think about it. If you've got, whether you've got a sister or not, whether you're male and you're trying to think what the females are like, if you have a love for a man and your sister's going to come in and get in there first, yeah. I just can't see yeah. anybody willingly she saying, oh, her. you know, yeah, I'll step aside. You go ahead and have yeah. them first and, and hopefully I'll get them so. after. You know. I think all that time she was thinking, I'm going to marry the man I love, I'm going to marry yes. and all of a sudden, the I, was pulled out. I absolutely believe it was pulled out the last minute on her. Yeah. I don't think that Laban tipped his hand. 
I think it could have been the very day, you know, that the, he did it. Maybe he even saw that Leia had an attraction to him too. And so she, he thought, hey, this isn't a bad thing because I want her to have somebody. So, you know, we don't know. We're, we're all reading into it, our own emotions and our own <laughs> feelings and our own thoughts because we're only given just the bare facts. The bare facts are Leia's put into Rachel's place <laughs> and the marriage is obviously consummated. So without saying any more on that. Um, Levon could have already been thinking ahead. I don't want to lose my, my, uh, my helper here you know, the services that Jacob's been giving me. So he could have been thinking, mm, you know, let me figure a way to get a little more out of him. Because notice how um, Jacob had to say to Laban, the seven years are up, you know, now give her to me. He should have been able to, to there should have been plans going on. He should have been seeing it happening. He shouldn't have had to, to almost demand it. You know, he's at least stepping up and speaking up for it. But I kind of get the idea Laban would have let it go indefinitely. It would have passed seven years. It would have passed eight years. It would have passed years. He's got free labor. Why is he going to give up a good thing like that? You know, so, but Jacob pulls him up and says, okay, hey, now you owe me. And Laban had to do what he had to do. And then somehow in that time, he devises his scheme. Okay. I'm going to get Leah in there. And so when he finds out, when Jacob finds out, then, um, are we ready for that? I think we are. We, yeah, that Laban gathered all the people, had the feast. Now in the evening, see, in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him. Okay, so obviously, in fact, let me say it in that right order. Obviously, Jacob was the one in the tent, and Leah's brought to him. Now, Leah had to have at least by that point been, been submitting to it. Because if she was fighting him going in, Jacob would know something's wrong. So Jacob's in there. Leah's brought in. She must be conceding or agreeing, whichever way it is. And we won't know till we meet her in heaven one day and ask her if we <laughs> care about it at that stage. Um, he brought her to Jacob, and Jacob had relations with her. That's why I'm saying the marriage was consummated, okay? So by this point, Leah's going along, at, you know, at least willingly enough. Um, Okay, I think I've said it, sorry. Laban also gave his female slave Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a slave. That's again the Eastern custom. Remember, Sarah had Hagar, and she gave Hagar to Avraham. That's just, you know, and we're going to see Leah's going to give her handmaid to Jacob, and Rachel's going to have a handmaid and do the same thing too. That was culturally accepted at that time. The, the slave women were not considered wives, and they didn't have the freedom to choose or not choose. They had to do what they were told, but it gave them a chance to have a, an essence of family also when, when this happened. So it was just accepted at the time. But you could tell also a layman was very deceitful because oh, yeah. uh, the oh, yeah. whole thing, oh, yeah. and even after he gets a, a Rachel, he still is trying to keep him there and all the goats. All the way to the end. 20 years that he's in the picture, he all the way through deceives, tries to gain for himself, does not seem to care for anybody but himself, at least not on the same level as himself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's his character. So he sneaks Leah in for whatever reason. Did he feel like it was his only chance? Don't know. Did he want to just make sure he had a way to keep Jacob working? Don't know. Maybe a little of both. But anyway. He was saving money, that's why he was out. Oh, yeah, 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 and probably had excellent help. I imagine Jacob put his whole heart and soul into it. He wanted to impress Rachel. He wanted to look good and do a good job. So, okay, so it came out in the morning. The sun comes up. There's a chance now that, that he can see that all of a sudden, behold, it's Leah. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got to imagine <clears throat> He's going to storm out of that tent. He's going to head straight for Laban. But we just get to where he is already to Laban because it says um, that he comes. And he said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? 
why then have you deceived me? So he's calling him out. You, you know, you, there's no reason that, that this has happened. Why on earth did you do this to me? It's he basically where he's at. Hands. He never mentioned it. It's Not so at all. It. And that's what we'll see in verse 26. That Levon said, it's not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. And then he goes on. Now, if that were true, and that maybe, <clears throat> if maybe overall it usually was true, but if that was the way it had to be done, Jacob would have known. He would have seen it all around him. You know, even though he hadn't been in that culture long, he'd been in that culture seven years, <laughs> he would have seen what was happening. If he saw that there was a younger one that wanted to get married and they said, we've got to marry off the older one first, he'd see that. He could easily apply that to himself and say, hmm, yeah. are we going to have a problem here because Rachel isn't Leah older than you? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously it was not such a well-known and well-acted um, upon, um, oh goodness, practice mm -hmm. that that it could be, you know, so. But Laban throws that out as his excuse that, well, we can't, uh, here we can't marry off the younger before the older. So just complete the week of this one. And I'll give you the other also for the service which, with, which you shall serve with me for another seven years. So finish the wedding week because it's night one when they consummate their marriage. Finish the wedding week with Leah. You can't have two wives in that one week. And then work another seven for me, and I will give you Rachel. And we do find out that he doesn't wait another seven years because, um, let me make sure I've told you everything first. Okay, I did tell you that. Let me bring out this point because we're guessing about the characters and what they were doing, what was behind their thoughts. Jacob and Rebecca felt that what they were doing was to accomplish God's will. When, when they deceived Isaac and cut Esau out of getting that, that blessing that he was not supposed to receive. So it could be that, that um, Laban and Leah thought that they in some way, well, I can't say that. I gotta take that back. As soon as I'm starting to say that, because Laban, I don't think had any thought toward God. Let me put it this way, okay? God used what Rachel and Jacob did for his will to be accomplished. He, the younger did receive the birthright, and they go on. We're going to see in this, Leah is the one who is going to give birth to Judah. He's going to be the one who is his line that leads to the Messiah. So even though this is Laban stepping in and doing it his own way, even though Jacob and, and Ray, uh, Rebecca stepped in and did things their own way, what I, I'm trying to point out to you is that God's end still was what came out of it. God intended for, um, I, uh, for Jacob to receive the birthright. God intended for Leah to be in the family to give birth to Judah, who would give birth down the line to Messiah. So no matter what, whether we understand and how the circumstances came about, God's will wasn't usurped. It wasn't off track, and he had to get it back on track. No, this, this was his plan, and he is going to bless Leah in that way. So even if she were, if this was done to her, and it wasn't so much her willingness, she's blessed. You know, God's not leaving her unblessed. Um, God allowed man to have his way, but he'll always always accomplish his will and that's what we can see in our circumstances today also god may allow man to have his way but god's will will be done and that should give you encouragement in your life if you're feeling that you've been wronged sometime trust god to bring out of that in the end what he wanted in your life what he wanted accomplished how he wanted to bless you also so keep that in mind but we'll go on here so um Okay, and I keep losing my place. There's no way for me to mark it. Okay, so Jacob did so, verse 28. Did I give that to you? I told you the bridal week, the seven days. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then when it says, let's go back into 27. Let me make sure I make clear to you, which you shall serve with me for another seven years. The way that the Hebrew says it does indicate that he gets Rachel before the seven years. So he's not going to wait another seven to get her. 
<clears throat> finish that week, then you'll get her. And we see that because look with me real quick at chapter 30 and verses 25 and 26, and it makes it a little more clear. And you think, too, if, if Laban was able to do that, then he could just go ahead and... He could sneak somebody else in again. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't uh, um, work seven years for Rachel? He did, but he, he worked them after the fact. He worked seven before and got Leah. Then he's going to get Rachel after that week. It's like back-to-back -back marriages. And he'll work seven more years well, after that. After they get married. After they get married, yeah. So at least Laban did that much. You know, he didn't hold him off for seven more years. That might have even been because Rachel had a fit at her dad for what he did. <laughs> Who knows? But anyway, um, in chapter 30, and verses 25 and 26, it says, Now it came about when Rachel had given birth to Joseph, that Jacob said to Levon, send me away so that I may go to my own place and to my own country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go for you yourself know my service which I have rendered you. Well, what was <coughs> Jacob referring to? Why could he say, hey, let me go? Joseph was born after, at the end of that seven years that Jacob, that, yeah, Jacob continued to work for Rachel. Um, that's why he was free to go. If Joseph had been born in the first of those seven years or the second of the seven years, he couldn't have gone to Laban and said, hey, give me my wives, give me my kids, I've, I've given you my time, I'm, I'm ready to go. But 14 years have now transpired, seven and seven. And we know that because we're going to see all the kids that are born to Jacob before um, Joseph is born, we're going to see the time that has passed. So we know that it's at 14 years at this point that uh, Jacob is able to say, okay, I've done my, my duty, now let me go. Okay, um, and then go back to the chapter we're in, chapter 29, and look at verse 30 on the way back. Okay, you can turn pages faster than my tablet, which there we go, <laughs> does not want to cooperate. Verse 30 of chapter 29, the one that we're in, says, So Jacob had relations with Rachel also, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban for another seven years. So between all those verses we know, he worked seven years, married Leah, a week passed, married Rachel, and worked seven more years. Okay, just making sure you understand the, the timeline there. So basically, when we go back up to verse 28, when it says Jacob did so and completed her week, and he gave him his daughter Rachel as, as his wife, they had back-to-back -back marriages. And in eight days, Jacob gets two wives. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. Now, later under law, and we'll look at that. That's Leviticus 18 and verse 18. They're not allowed to marry sisters like this. And it's no wonder. I, I think anybody, whether they're sisters or not, can imagine the friction that would take place in a situation like this. And we know there's a lot of friction in the households that we're going to be reading about. Leviticus 18.18 18 says, You shall not marry a woman in addition to her sister as a second wife while she is alive to uncover her nakedness. This is when the law is being given. So you are not to marry a sister. You know, if you, if you married one, you can't marry a, a sister as your second wife. That's just not allowed. Where was that? Leviticus 18, oh, 18. 18, 18. Yeah, Viagra in Hebrew, Leviticus 18, in English. 18, 18. So, 18, they, 18. so they broke that law? This was prior to the law. This, they, we don't have Moses yet. No. We don't have law yet. But you can no. see why God put it into yeah. order. This was not a good idea. <laughs> Thankfully, it wasn't law then, or he would never get Rachel. Sure and that would have even been worse. So. He probably would have been one to kill him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know there wasn't there wasn't a way to get rid of Leah. That would have been right, you know. So God didn't let that happen. But okay, back in twenty nine, um, let me re explain to you something I think is easily missed. Um, first, let me give you because I haven't given you tw verse twenty nine. Levon also gave his female slave Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her slave. So Jacob's got the two wives, Leah and Rachel, and they each have a handmaid. They each have they start out with a servant for themselves, Zilpah and Bilhah. 
Okay, now verse 30. So Jacob had relations with Rachel also, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah. Notice the way that said. That indicates he did either learn to or did have a love for Leah also. I imagine he had a love for her like a sister, and it developed a bit more in, as the years moved on. But uh, and maybe I shouldn't say as a sister because he's, he has relations with her. You don't have relations with your sister. But uh, the idea is, I will hear people say, Rachel was loved and Leah was hated. And they especially get it because of verse 31, but it's not meant to that degree in our English that that's sounding. When verse 31 says, Now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. That unloved would have been in contrast. Jacob so loved Rachel that it made it look like he didn't love Leah. The same way that God says, Esau I've hated, Jacob I've loved. Well, we know God didn't literally hate Esau. It was that Hebrew idiom that was showing the contrast, one so great, the other, you know, falls in comparison. So, you know, even though Leah's got her husband, she's having relations with him, he still is more attracted and more drawn to Rachel. And well, you can't blame that. him. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> that was from the get-go. That was from day one. He met yeah. Rachel. He, he fell on her. He, he <laughs> worked with her. Then he asked for her hand in marriage. Obviously, that was where his heart was. But the Lord saw that. He saw that, that Leah is in that lesser position. So he's going to give Leah a blessing. He's yeah. going to, to bring to her. Um, he opens her womb. But Rachel was unable to have children. Now, that's not fair. God should have been... Should have blessed Rachel. Too. <laughs> I'm not going to say God wasn't fair, but I do say that God saw Leah, and you know that's why I think maybe she even went along because maybe she did think it is my only chance, and maybe she really just she didn't have a lot of say. I'm not sure that she. Let's do this, yeah. Dad. But, you know, at least at least you had to go along. And so God wanted to give her a blessing. But he doesn't bless Rachel. I don't understand. If God's love, and he knows it was love from the beginning, why cheat her out of that love that she could have had children? She does have children. Yeah. Oh. It yeah. takes time. It <laughs> takes <laughs> time. <laughs> but let's look at Sarah. Sarah didn't have children for 25 years. God didn't let her. Hannah loved God, worshipped him, was in the temple, praying her heart out when she finally receives a promise that she'll have a son. And remember, her husband felt so bad for her, you know, he, he just heaped on her everything he could, all kinds of other blessings that didn't equal what her heart was crying for. And we're going to see Rachel's heart gets to that point where she just cries out in agony for a child. But God is supreme and sovereign, and he has his reasons and his ways. Mm -hmm. Why he didn't allow Rachel also earlier, I don't know. It wasn't her fault that her dad no, or it, her, it wasn't know. at all. It wasn't at so all. why would she have to suffer? To, to because be it wasn't a punishment. It was a delay for God's timing. Why, I cannot give you, but the same with Sarah. It wasn't a punishment. Mankind looked at it that way. Mankind said... If you don't have children, God's upset with you. He's keeping you from having children. You got something you need to get right between you and God. But Sarah didn't have that. Hannah certainly didn't have that. We have many different times. We have Elisheva, Elizabeth, who gives birth to John the Baptist as an old lady. She thought she was going to go all the way through her life not having children. And she was given that blessing late in life when, when it looked pretty much impossible. So it was not a judgment on Rachel, but Rachel kind of felt like it was. Yeah. Sarah had her moments, you know, why isn't God doing this? Here, take my handmaid, <laughs> you know. So we, we it see. It's different because, Mo, uh, because uh, Abram, he loved Sarah and, and God blessed him, but look at what she had to go through. Right, right. And that second baby, you're, you're trapped by your words. I don't agree with that being that way. I know that there are those who say well, that. But it. Dying anyway, so that we'll go to that when we get to that <laughs> point because I don't agree with that. That gives control of life and death 
to men. That controls only in God's hands. Um, and there are many, many, many times that comments have been made and not fulfilled in that way. So I know what you're saying. I know what you're alluding to. Yeah, and, and we'll I'll deal with it too. head on strong when we yeah. get there. But for any others that aren't there yet, hang tight. You'll <laughs> understand when we get there. Now, one thing, too, about Leah. Um, he probably had a love for her in the sense that, you know, she was sweet and kind and all that kind of stuff. But having a baby kind of locks you in well, in that's a what, special way. That's what and we're it, going to see right. is how Rachel's feeling and how, um, right. how Leah probably, looked at it too. Because by the time we get to fourth son, we'll, we'll see a comment. Fourth or fifth son, we'll see a comment she makes that fits but, right in with what you're saying. That's why I was saying that's good. God probably did it that way. Because, Maybe it's the third son. I, one of those. We'll get to <laughs> it. We'll get to it in my notes. But yeah. But initially, yes. Maybe it was for Leah to have something but it wasn't meant as a punishment for Rachel. Oh, no, not at all. That's that's the hard part to see and the hard part to understand, but there are delays in our lives sometimes when we don't know why. And we may never know why till we're home in heaven and if we still care then and we ask then, God will tell us and we'll say, That was the best way <laughs> because God's ways always are the best. Yeah, she sure suffered, yeah, at first, you know, Rachel did. Yeah, she loved him and she did. And she was cheated she out did. of him. I can't him. imagine that marriage night you know, mm -hmm. how she felt. But that's why I say, I, in my mind, I think she had been locked up somewhere. <laughs> that she didn't break it down to, you know, be able to, to stop what was happening. But let's go ahead and let's read on in the next verses and see. Because God does open Leah's womb, whether we agree or disagree, God does, and God's ways are best. So Leah conceived and gave birth to a son and named him Reuben. For she said... Because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. So Leah at least felt like Jacob really didn't love her. But she had to have known that from the get-go. He didn't hide that. He didn't pretend. Rachel didn't come along later. and He was already married to Leah. And, so, and his eyes wandered. You know, it was nothing wandered. It was nothing like that. But she gives birth to Reuben. And she says, in Hebrew it means, see, a son. You know, I've got a son. So she felt like this was going to make Jacob really love her. She conceived again. Um, did I do all verse 32? Yeah, I did. Okay, for surely my husband will love me. 33. Then she conceived again, gave birth to the son, and said, Because the Lord has heard that I'm unloved, he's therefore given me this son also. And Shimon, or Simeon, as you say in your English, is the name of the second son, and it means hearing, or in essence, God's heard her prayer. So Leah does have somewhat of a relationship with God, because she's praying to God to have children, and she is feeling, I think there's competitiveness here. She wants Jacob to love her as much as he loves Rachel. So I can't get him to love me on my own, let me have a son, now let me have another son, and surely now Jacob's going to look and, and he's going to see, well, on the right hand, I have my beautiful Rachel who has my heart. But on my left hand, I do have Leah, but I've got Leah and a son and another son. So she's thinking, you know, the scales are going to balance more. He's going to love me more because I've got these children. So that's, that's her idea. And she conceives again in verse 34 and says, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. So she named him Levi or, or Levi or Levi, however you say it. And it means joined or attached. So now she's thinking, surely I've got three little Jacobs here, three, three little juniors. Surely Jacob's going to attach himself to me. He's going to spend time with me. He's going to want time with his sons. I can one-up Rachel now, is how she's feeling, that, that now she's got a reason why Jacob's going to be drawn to her. He wasn't drawn to her for herself, but that's okay with her as long as he's drawn to her because he wants to be with his three sons. So she thinks she's really, you know, attaining. And in that, she conceives again, verse 34, and gives birth to a son, and this time she says, Now I'll praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah, or Judah as you say, because that means praise, and she's praising Jehovah for her sons. And that's when she stopped having children. So she's got four sons. Surely, 
Jacob loves her now, and so I praise you, Lord, because you heard my cries. You gave me all of these children so that Jacob will love me. That's her way of thinking and you looking. Rachel cried too, and if she didn't get that. Yes, <laughs> Rachel. That would really affect me, boy. Well, <laughs> well, Rachel. But also. then again, God gives us gifts. She gave Rachel the gift of beauty, and gave the other one the gift but of she love. She that want is. to be loved, and if you don't have the love, it's it's no. You get competitive, and you fight for that love, and Leah fought for it with her babies, with her, you know. Yeah, Rachel, she, she couldn't fight with nothing. Right, right. But tears. But this happened in four years too. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, oh, wow. she she's pregnant every year for four years. Okay, so now going to verse thir uh, chapter thirty because we do want to see how Rachel's reacting. And we do read, when Rachel saw that she had not borne Yaakov any children, she became jealous of her sister. And she said to Yaakov, give me children or else I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. Okay, when we read those words that she became jealous or she envied whatever your scripture says, the indication from the Hebrew is she felt like she had borne all she could, could stand. So yes, the first one was was hurtful. The second one hurt all the more. By the third one, she's really hurting to have her own baby. And now a fourth <clears throat> has come along, and she just is in absolute agony. Um, especially because, again, in that day, it was a disgrace to not have offspring. So she's not only feeling, I want what Leah's got, and maybe Jacob's attention was more over there. Maybe when he came in from the field at night, he wanted to go play with his kids. You know, and maybe Rachel was getting less of him. Whatever, between all that and feeling that, that she was being disgraced, that she was, that it was showing that, that there was something wrong between her and God, she is crying out in her agony, and she cries out to her mate. She cries out to the one that she loves. And, uh, um, she just, in, in that outburst, give me children or I'll die, it, she's, she's shouting it at Jacob, but it's not his fault. Mm -hmm. Okay, so obviously he didn't neglect her. He didn't just see Leah, just have relations with Leah, because he could have said to her, well, you know, all right, I'll concede, I'll, I'll give you a chance. No, so obviously he was having relations with her, but what we're seeing is a very unhappy household. And really, polygamy is an unhappy household. <laughs> it, there's a lot of grief. There's a lot of heartache. Uh, domestic troubles. I'm sure there was competition all the way. You know, um, I'll just give you a, a way to laugh that's not on this level. But uh, when my brother was growing up, there was a couple of years in there that he had a best friend. And they were old enough that they would go back and forth to each other's houses. And... There is a week where David and Richard ate dinner at our house every single night. <laughs> well, Richard's mom found out what was going on. <laughs> They'd call up and find out from both moms what was for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and then they went to the house that had the dinner they wanted. Oh, no. <laughs> and because my mom was winning out, Donna did so. I don't remember what she did, but she pulled out all the stops, made <laughs> Richard's favorite, did everything she could to get Richard to. And it worked because that night, David and Richard ate a hurry. <laughs> so we laughed at that for years to come. Oh. And it doesn't carry the severity of what's going on here. But with these children, with the lack of children, with it being a disgrace, with Rachel feeling like, you know, this is all that matters to her because really that was what was the important role of a wife was to have the children and was to raise the children. She was just as as, as agony, agonizing as possible. And Jacob obviously was too because it tells us in verse 2, his anger burned against Rachel. He lashed back out at Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of your womb? He's, that's why we know he hasn't withheld. He's mm -hmm. saying, okay, I can't help it. God's withheld it from you. So we see, you know, they're not having a happy moment here together. I think uh, Jacob oh. should have went out and had a talk with God alone. Had well, talk with mm -hmm. Jesus. guess who apparently did have a talk with God? <laughs> Was Rachel. 
okay? Because we're going to see that very soon she does have a child and what she names him does give us the idea that she took Jacob's words to heart, that it is God who's withholding and she did have conversation with God and God did bless her. Now again, we're reading some of that in the same way we're reading in their emotions and how they're feeling. But, um, um, but Rachel took things in her own hands first, okay? Verse 3, and again, Sarah, you got to have a son. You got to have one to pass on your heritage to. Take my handmaid. So that's in their heritage. That's in their knowledge. And what do we see Rachel do? Then she said, here's my female slave Bilhah. Have relations with her that she may give birth on my knees so that I by her too may obtain a child okay in the hebrew I have children be built so my house will be built okay if if you know we're they're lashing out in their emotions they're both angry jacob's saying take it up with god and rachel's saying okay take bill hot the children that you have by her will be considered mine. That's why that phrase in there, um, on my knees, how does it say it? I just read it to you. Um, yeah, so that she may give birth on my knees. Now, without getting real graphic and without knowing exactly how the facts were in that time, when a handmaid was brought in for the sake of having children, it's said that either at the time of inception or at the time of delivery, or at both times, that the real wife was right in there in the middle of it, so that it didn't turn out to be, uh, I mean, if you knew your wife was right there watching you, you're not going to feel, you know, the love, emotions toward this person. You're going to be reminded you're doing a duty, and this slave person is also going to know you're not getting in as a wife. You're here for a purpose. You're here to be womb for rent okay <laughs> so yeah yeah and and some say that they literally that and i don't i don't see how but they say that they literally um the one giving birth would give birth on the knees of the real wife you know i don't think it means literally to that point but she was right in there in the thick of it in the middle of it and being reminded all the time i'm the wife this child's going to belong to me so mm -hmm. that's why it's phrased that way okay yes, but i mean we don't know maybe god's plan was that she was going to bless he was going to bless leah that she was going to be the mother of the one that the line goes through right they didn't and know it that had to be leah not the not Rachel, for whatever reasons, God's choosing. Why did God choose Jacob? Why did God choose Isaac? Why did God choose Abraham? Why did God choose Leah? Even though Rachel's in that family line, why did he choose Leah to, you know? Rachel's got great claim to fame because um, Paul comes from Rachel's offspring. So, and he's a giant in our spiritual faith. Well, Obviously, he's not the Messiah. <laughs> Or I was saying at least some good came to the poor girl. <laughs> but yes, this is God's sovereign, supreme will. You know, that's all we can say. So um, when we read on, though, we see in verse 6, well, no, I didn't do you verse 4, did I? I've got it. Yeah, I did 3. Okay. So she gave him her slave, Bilhah, as a wife. Yaakov had relations with her. Bill conceived and bore Jacob a son. Okay, now, verse 6 is key. Then Rachel said, Elohim, the strong one who is faithful. Elohim, Elohim has vindicated me and has indeed heard my voice and has given me a son. So she did feel like God justified her in his sight. You know, in, I'm sorry, not in God's sight, in Jacob's sight. Because she cried out to Jacob that she wasn't having children he more or less said, it's, you know, the, that's God, not me. She takes it up with God. God blesses her through her handmaid, and she feels justified. Okay, look, Jacob, God is blessing on this side. So she's feeling like this justifies it. She's feeling like God heard her voice. She probably did, because to say they heard her voice, she probably did cry out to God, why am I not pregnant? Please let me have children. If not me, let Bill hop. And Bilhah did. And so she named him Don, we say Dan, 
which is right here. God vindicated. He heard my voice. He's given me a son. She named him Don or Dan. And then Rachel's slave, Bilhah, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And then the answer to this, the name of this one, also gives us that insight. So Rachel said, with mighty wrestling, I have wrestled with my sister, and I have indeed prevailed. And she named him Naphtali. And Naphtali means wrestling. So she is feeling, um, and it is, the idea is with mighty wrestling with God. You know, that she's struggling with God, and God's indicated that he's heard her, and he's helping her by allowing the birth of these two sons through Bilhah. So obviously she's feeling, I, I'm vindicated with Leah, you know, with my sister, because she says that, um, with mighty wrestling, I've wrestled with my sister. So it's that competitive spirit. Okay, Leah got ahead of me and had children, but now I've got two, so... She's beginning to feel justified. She's beginning to feel like she's been heard. She, she, um, that wrestling, Naphtali, that wrestling is wrestling earnestly in prayer. So she was wrestling with this. And she was taking it to God, and God at least has blessed her through Bilhah. That's what she's seeing and saying at this point. So, and by the way, just because we brought up that other issue that's going to come up later, if, if her words are supposed to be condemning her, as far as she's concerned, as far as the way it's looked at, it's looked at as now she does have children. So give me children or I'll die. She does have children. It isn't that the words carry on to that other. But we'll talk again more about that when we get down the road. So she's got two. She's, she's happy. Um, and Leah has stopped at this point. But then what happens? Okay. When Leah saw that she had stopped having children, she sees her sister having children. Uh-oh, <laughs> Jacob's going to have as many over here. I'm going to lose my husband again to Rachel. So, well, I know how Rachel had those children. She gave Bilhah. So what's Leah going to do? I'm going to give you Zilpah. So she, Leah's slave Zilpah um, was given to Jacob. It says as a wife, but again, remember they were not taken in. It wasn't a marriage. It wasn't looked on as third wife. These were, these were the ones that did not have the blessings that a wife gets, but they, the, they, they served their purpose. They were a surrogate, okay? So Leah, um, Leah's slave, verse 10, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, how fortunate. Um, now, the Hebrew literally says, with fortune. We're told later that it means a troop, T-R-O-O-P, but really Gad in English, God in Hebrew, and it doesn't mean God like Elohim. Remember, you don't say God in Hebrew, you say Elohim. So you don't say Gad in Hebrew, you say God, but I'll say Gad so you don't get confused. Um, having a third son, some said, well, she's got a whole troop now. So <laughs> they gave that meaning there, but it comes from the root that means to assemble. Now, granted, you can assemble a troop, and in Jewish tradition, they'll say, a fortune comes, a troop comes, because children are a blessing. Children are your fortune. Children are rich for you. And Jacob's prophecy in Genesis 49 gives that thought also. I'm going to take you over to Genesis 49. Oh, yeah, but you got time because my tablet does not want to cooperate. Okay, there we go. Genesis 49. Oh, 49. Chapter. Chapter 49. I'm sorry, not verse. Chapter 49 and verse 19. This is the great prophecy Jacob gives over his 12 sons. And in verse 19, he says, As for Gad, a band of raiders shall attack him, but he will attack at their heels. And so when it's saying that there's a band of raiders, that again, a troop, a band. And so that's what people jump on, and that's what they'll say most of the time, that it means a troop, but it really meant with fortune. The, the closest I can get is with three children, she's got a fortune. Okay, uh, what does Dan mean? Dan? Judging. Did I not bring that out? I'm yeah. sorry. Judging. That God had judged oh. her and judged her worthy to have children and has blessed her with a child. So when we say Daniel, Daniel, that's God is my judge. 
Dan is just the judge or judging part, and in this case, it's judging. And Dan, Daniel, Danielle, God is my judge. So, um, so God judged and found Rachel worthy of having children through um, Bilhah, and then gave Naphtali. Um, she's saying, I, I wrestled with God in prayer, and he has answered me. And now Leah is saying, I'm fortunate. I've got, you know, with good fortune coming because now I've got Gad. I'll, I'll use the English. Later, we see Gad is associated with a pagan god of luck. And it almost fits with this fortune, too, that she was looking at it like she had good luck. But that's not what it was. It wasn't luck at all. God is building the house. So let me go, and that's the house of Israel I'm referring to. Let me go back to Genesis 29. No, we're in 30, remember? 31. Oh, sorry, sorry, you're right. In chapter 30, my tablet, um, which isn't working, there we go. Um, it's still on 29, that's why I set up it. Thank you, you are right. We're in 30 and verse 11. Uh, and I think we might even be past 11 when I get there. No, no, there we go. How fortunate, so she named him Gad. And Leah's slave Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. So Bilhah's had two, and Zilpah has had two. And Leah said, happy am I, for women will call me happy. So she named him Asher, or Asher, which means happy, or some will even say means blessing. Well, by now Leah has six for her own, two through her handmaid. She does feel happy. She's got a whole troop, if you want to put it that way. She's got a whole uh, flock of following her, and so she is happy. And Rachel is probably beginning to feel that imbalance again. She was starting to catch up, but if you kept the, the score, it was four to two. <laughs> now it's six to two. So Rachel's again beginning to feel, I got to get something going here. Where are we? We can go a little bit further. So, now in the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben, who would have been about six years old by now because we've got that many years that have passed in, in having the children, he was firstborn, he went out and he found mandrake fruits in the field and he brought them to his mother, Leah. Now, what are mandrakes? Um, a popular name for mandrakes is called love apples. And it's a two what? love apples. Love apple? Yes. And you'll understand why in a minute. <laughs> it's a tuberous plant with a yellow plum-like fruit. And it was supposed to be a love charm. It would ripen in May approximately. It would ripen at the time of, of um, the wheat harvest. And in ancient days and still today by the Arabs in the East, that fruit was thought to promote childbearing. It's only superstition. There is no supernatural qualities to it. There's no medicinal qualities to it. it it's superstition. But it was, a, it was a superstition back in that time and still superstition today. So Reuben probably, being a little bit older than the others, he was out in the field and he was playing the, the, where the harvest is growing and he sees these pretty plants and he brings them to his mom. Now maybe he even knew his mom liked those plants, you know, for whatever reason, for, for the superstition or for the beauty or whatever, but she, he brought them to his mom. Now Rachel sees that happen, and so she says, she jumps in there, she says, Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Verse 15, but Leah, she said to her, Rachel, is it a small matter for you to take my husband? And would you take my son's mandrakes also? In other words, Rachel, you've got Jacob. You've got Jacob's heart. Now you want my mandrakes, which, which will help me ha get some of his love toward me? Really? You've got it all, Rachel, is basically what no she's saying. Oh, come on. That, in those days, it was very important to a woman have children. Exactly. Even though she had two through Bilhah, she mm -hmm. still lacked her own. And Rachel, uh, Leah's not sympathetic to Rachel about that at all because she's too busy fighting for Jacob's love. If I don't have this, you'll have everything. So why should I give you my son's mandrakes, okay? Um, okay, so when it says here, uh, therefore he may lay with you tonight, are they talking about Jacob? 
Yes. They're not talking about the sun. No, 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 no. He's They're six talking. years old. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it doesn't matter, but I mean, you know. But right, yeah. then, then let's get us straight. So let's back up just slightly because you're just slightly ahead of me. Um, so let's read it in order so it does make sense. So um, Leah said to Rachel, is it a small matter for you to take my husband? Would you take my son's mandrakes also? That also tells us even though Leah had more children, Jacob was still more in love with Rachel than Leah, at least in Leah's opinion and how she's feeling. Okay, so when Jacob came, uh, did I skip anything? No, so Rachel said, therefore he may, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to mess you up. Let, let's, let me read this straight from 15 on. She said to her, is a small matter for you to take my husband? Would you take my son's mandrix also? So Rachel said, therefore, he may sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrix. Okay, I'll give you Jacob tonight. You give me the mandrix. Remember, she's thinking those will help her get pregnant. So when Jacob came in from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him. And she said, you must have relations with me, for I indeed hired you with my son's mandrix. So he slept with her that night. So obviously, Leah's got her own tent. Rachel's got her own tent. Jacob's coming in from the field. He thinks it's a day like every other day. And he must have gone more often to Rachel's tent, even though obviously he has spent time over here because he's got six kids over here. But um, Leah meets him at, at the path and says, Hey, you're mine tonight. I bought you. Rachel gets the mandrakes, but I get you tonight. And what happens that very night? Poor yeah, <laughs> here we go. Yeah. I have heard, and forgive me, Dave and Roger and any other men, I think Tony's around too and any other men, but I've heard men say, oh, to have four, you know, to have two women fighting over me and two on the side. Yeah, right. <laughs> four times the headache, right, Dave? <laughs> Yeah, shaking his head, yes. <laughs> yeah, but I have heard some say they think that's a man's dream, but I don't think so. So, Leah's met him, told him, you're mine, so you li you're going to sleep with me tonight. In verse 17, God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. So, yeah, she got a chance that night because she gave the mandrakes to Rachel. She was praying to God to have a child, and so... Um, so God did hear her and did allow her to have another son. I'm looking to see if I missed anything. Let me make clear, the mandrakes are not what made Rachel pregnant and Leah not, or vice versa. That's only the superstition. We see clearly every time these girls conceived that it was God who gave them the child. It was God who blessed the womb. So it's God who is giving them these children and building the house of Israel. It was nothing else, nothing but. But as far as Leah is concerned right now, she's hired him. She gets pregnant. And so she says, God's given me my reward because I gave my slave to my husband. No, I skipped. I missed in there. Sorry. Yeah, he slept. I didn't miss anything because he no, slept with her that night. Yeah, okay. God listened to her. I did. I missed verse 17. God listened to her, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has given me my reward because I gave my slave to my husband. So she named him um, Yisachar. Is really about the closest to Hebrew I can get in the pronunciation, and it does mean a hire or a reward. So she took it that this was her reward because she was willing to share with Rachel. Okay? And she also shared Jacob with her maid. So she's being very generous and God's blessing her. That's how she's seeing herself. Okay? So, um, and Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son to Jacob. And by now then, Leah said, God has endowed me with a good gift. Finally, my husband will acknowledge me as his wife because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulun, dwelling. She was convinced at this point with six sons, Jacob's going to come dwell with her or at least spend more time with her, be in her tent more. So again, I think up to this point, Jacob's been spending more time in Rachel's tent. 
and she's thinking, this is going to do it. Now I'm going to win my husband over, and with six sons, how could he not want to be in my tent? So she thinks she's one-upped Rachel. You can again just see that competition. She's fighting for Jacob's love. She wants to be his number one. Afterward, she even gave birth again and gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah in English, Dina in the, the Hebrew. And again, because it's off the same root, it means judgment off the same root as Dan, is the name Dan. So it means judgment. Um, later, Jacob has more daughters because we read that, and I'll show you, I want to prove to you. Go with me to Genesis 37 and verse 35. Genesis 37 and verse 35. There we go. Chapter 37, whoops, verse 35. And it says, then all his, referring to Jacob, 34 tells us, so Jacob tore his clothes, put on a sackcloth, undergarment over his waist, mourned for her, his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters, plural, got up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. So here it shows us, that he had more than one daughter. Chapter 46 will also show us that he had more than one daughter. Chapter 46, verses 7 and 15. His sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters, plural, and his granddaughters, all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. So when he moved his family down into Egypt, when Joseph was on the throne in Egypt, he had daughters. Verse 15 of the same chapter. These are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob and put on Aram, with his daughter Dina, all his sons and his daughters, numbered 33. So we don't know. know. That was the same chapter, 46. Verse 15. I did 46 verse 7 and 46 verse 15. So three times we're told in Scripture he had daughters, daughters, daughters. Dina's the only name we know. It might be because we know what happened to Dina later. That comes up in chapter 34. There's a, a huge incident with her. It might be why she got named. I don't know. But the sons we know are the 12 tribes. We needed to know their names. And the daughter that we see um, with circumstances, unhappy circumstances. But still, it might be why we've got the name here. But we've got now afterward, after her six sons, she gave birth to the daughter. Um, and that could indicate even that Dina was born later. Um, you know, we don't know how fast Dina was born. We're not sure. But we know that, that Jacob worked 14 years together for Rachel. You know, the seven promised and then the seven more that he had to work. And we're going to see that he stays on six more years with Laban, Laban. So he's going to be there 20 years. Okay, so um, we see, what am I trying to bring out? Just that that time could have passed in here some, but in there somewhere, Dina is born. So all this time, Rachel has still waited. She's still crying out to God in her agony. She does have two sons by her um, handmaid, but... Finally, and only God can answer why. We got a question. Say, so who is Dina's mother? Leah. Huh? Leah. Oh. Yeah, because, or Leah, however you pronounce it, because 19 and Leah conceived again, had the six sons, said that, that good gift, God, um, Jacob will acknowledge me as, as, my, as his wife. She named him Zebulun. Afterward, she gave birth to a daughter and named her Dina. So that's why it's all talking about Leah, or Leah, however you say the name. So, yeah, so she's the one that, that had the, the daughter. And we know that Rachel didn't have any daughters anyway because Rachel does die in childbirth with her second son. So the girls that Jacob had had have come from Leah or the handmaids. And this one in particular she came from there. because she got cheated. <laughs> I'm going to ask God about that. She okay. Okay. Two kids, and then she's up dying. They got in favor of her. 
I'm sorry, I didn't favor Rachel. We definitely don't see favor towards her in At the all. baby in the baby department. Yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> okay, well you can ask Scott. I am. <laughs> because that's I don't fair. have an answer for well, you. Well, that's how come he gave favor some person one way, favor to another person another way, and we just don't question. We do question, but we don't know. Right, and we just have to accept that God's sovereign will and His sovereign plan. There is a reason, and it will make sense. But you did say something very good there, Dora. And not that I'm saying it with you, Loretta, all because I'm not. But so often people will look at, well, she got that gift. She got blessed with that. He got that. Why didn't I? You know, I didn't get anything. Well, no, God's blessed you also. You need to look at what blessings he's given you and get that right from the Lord. But it isn't ours to question. You know, I, I'll tell you, and, and I, I'm flipping this because it's not the negative, but I've asked the Lord, why did you choose me to get to teach your word and to get to be a missionary that shares that that's what my whole life is, is involved in? I don't get it, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but many times, I've heard so many look and say, well, I wish I had that. I wish I was more like that person. I wish I had that gift. That's what, no. If you feel yeah. lack, go to God and ask God. Okay, like, but, yeah, and that's why I say I'm not saying it about you. Oh, no. You know, right. I, I'm not personalizing it at all. Well, the only reason I, because I know when I'm so starved for love in my early years, God was there. there God's yeah. love. Well, where's his love now? But they love each other. He takes that away from her and lets her die with no extra blessing. I don't understand that love part when God's supposed to be so loving yet and they loved each other, but where's the blessing from it? The you blessing what I'm talking about? Yeah, we cannot see the blessing physically no. in what what happened with her. But as soon as you started and you said in my I thought to myself, what would Rachel say? If she could speak to you today, would she say, oh, yeah, I didn't get blessed in that area, but let me tell you about this. Let me tell you how God met me. Let me tell you how I had something very special between just God and me. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what she would say, but I have a feeling she'd have an answer for you. I have a feeling you don't even have to go to God. You can go to Rachel and say, what's up? What did I miss <laughs> in this? <laughs> Dora? Yes, but... Although she didn't see it, but her son was the one that saved the Jewish nation because he became the... Yes, yes, he was the... the, the uh, when we enemy. say the savior of the nation, we don't mean capital S. No, no. But he did save the nation from, from extinction, yes. from starvation. Mm -hmm. God did use him greatly. And yes, and he was a very blessed son, and we'll get into all the arguments on that also. So yes, yes, and the the meaning of the names of the sons when I get there too for her two sons are wow, because you're going to see how that ties into the Messiah also. So yes, and my whole point of bringing it out is, um, in the hardest places of my life, I have something. That's where I really grew in the Lord. That's where I, the depth that I have with Him. Um, how do I say this the right way? Because I'm not, I'm not prideful about this at all, okay? But I can treasure those hard, hard times mm -hmm. because I can look back at them and say, wow, I really see how I grew in you, Lord. How I grew, you know, I, I learned, I understood, I grew. I hopefully conformed more to be like you and like what you want in those hard times. I'm thankful for the blessings and the easy times, but I treasure the hard times because of what it instilled in me and how it caused me to put down roots that when another storm comes, I'm not blown as easily as I would have been without that. That's what I'm trying to say. So maybe in that way, maybe whatever else was going on in Rachel's life that's not recorded because we only have a bare outline, Maybe in that, Rachel would say, you know, it was the hardest thing in the world for me to go through, but I treasure it because I got this out of it. I learned this about God. I grew closer to God. I da, 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 da. Who knows what she would say? I will agree with you when I say we don't see it physically. We, we want her to be blessed with children. We want her to have all of this because of what that means to us. But 
I do think there's an answer there that we can't give because we haven't been in her shoes and we don't have her whole story. Well, the thing is, you know, God is love, but, you know, when there's true love, why aren't they being blessed? That part, I don't because your love is so important to God. Then why wasn't her prayers of being loved so... Well, know? she was loved. She wasn't being blessed with the offspring yeah. of her love. But she was being loved because Leah, six sons later, is saying, now he's going to stay in my tent, yeah. which means he wasn't. Mm -hmm. So Rachel was still getting the love of her husband. Well, she should have understood that, too. But I know it's hard for a woman. And especially sisters that, that are going to feel yeah. competitive. And especially the way it got started. That wasn't fair to either girl. No matter how it went down, it wasn't fair. If yeah, Leah was a willing participant, then yeah. I think God's hand should have been harsher against her. But I don't know that she was willing. And I'm not here to judge and say because I know God does everything right. So somehow this was right, Loretta. Somehow this was right. You know, that the, the way God saw it, what chapter man, the way that God saw it, um, it, it, it was all done perfectly. It was not done amiss. It was not done because they took matters in their own hands. You know, it was like those mandrakes. Leah didn't get pregnant by mandrakes, and Perfect. Rachel didn't either. You know, that's just hogwash, folks. Yeah, that's just fruit. Was that just fruit like, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it just, you know, we have foods that we say are aphrodisiacs, you know, that, that you know, it kind of leads into that, but they took it to another level. But we do see that God did bless Leah with these children, and especially, and I agree with Dora in that, especially with Judah, you know, out of all, he's the one that led to the Messiah, so... Um, you would have thought, well, he'd give that one to Rachel, but see, he has his reason. He has, this was the way it was right, and I can't answer any more than that. I just say, you know, God knows, and God's way is best, so take it up with God, <laughs> and he'll answer you, but I think Rachel will love you for your care for her. <laughs> but it doesn't end there, because verse 22, God remembered Rachel. God gave heed, he hearkened to her, to her cries, God listened to her, and he opened her womb. Notice how, once again, how did they get pregnant? God opened oh, the womb. womb yeah. it, it's only and solely by God. Oh, my word, it's a quarter to four. I know. Why didn't somebody tell me? <laughs> well, we're enjoying it. <laughs> and I'm enjoying it. Yeah. I didn't get as far as I wanted. I wanted to get into all the names and all, but that'll make you want to come back. Let me just finish up here real quick. So she conceived, she gave birth to a son, and she said, God has taken away my disgrace. Because if the, if the other women and others were looking at her as you are disgraced by God because your womb hasn't been opened, well, now now she has the answer to that. Whatever well, why was you there. Die for it? That comes later. <laughs> i got to move on right now. Right now she's happy. Right now God's heard her, and she named him Yosef, saying, May the Lord give me another son. Okay, so when she says that God remembered her, the scripture says God remembered this Elohim, the strong one who is faithful. He's the one who remembered her, uh, her reproach being sterile. The divine reproach is now gone. And so she's saying, yes, I got a son of me. God, give me another one. <laughs> and so she names him Yosef because Yosef means Addy. So she, in faith, believes she's going to have another son. And we do know that's fulfilled. She does have another son, Benjamin, Benjamin. Um, that's in chapter 35 and verse 18. And as I said, from the line of Benjamin, Benjamin comes Paul. So she gets a good claim to fame there too. Not equal to Messiah. Not, nothing's equal to Messiah. But when we come back next week, because we've gone through all the births now, we've got all the, the 12 tribes have been born now, I will give you what I said in the text for those who get the text. We'll look at the pro prophetic significance of their names, how it's going to be Israel's, what we call now history, but it's going to be the timeline of Israel. We'll see it through the names of the son, the sons, sorry, uh, plural. And then I also will take you and show you in a spiritual sense what we personally can gain through the names of the sons. It's very interesting. I, I really like it. 
And I will tell you, because I'm always here to tell you, those who don't want to wait for next Wednesday, a little <coughs> bit of this, not everything, but a little bit of this just happens to be part of my Friday night message. So those who can pick up Zoom or be with us in the desert, you'll get a sneak peek on Friday night to part of it, but you won't get all of it. <laughs> so, yeah, well, we let me close in prayer fast, open it to comments. I had no idea. I would have gone on another hour. Sorry, folks. Lord God, thank you. You are faithful. And even when we do not understand, your ways are right. They're, your ways are above our ways, your thoughts even above our thoughts. And, Lord, we, we are so just insignificant dust on us the face of this earth at this time in history, how could we begin to say that, that we know or we understand? So Lord, where we don't, let us walk it by faith. Where we do understand, let us praise you all the more. But we thank you that no matter what, whether we understand your plan, we know your heart. We know that, that it's always, that you are always faithful and it is always right. So we thank you that you are almighty God Thank you that you don't give us our will and our ways when it isn't what's best for us. Thank you that you do love us as the perfect parent who gives good gifts to his children and that anything you withhold is not a blessing for us. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for being sovereign. We thank you for being awesome. We thank you for being in control. Understanding. Always in understanding. And thank you that the peace of God goes beyond understanding and all and misunderstanding also. So let us trust you, praise you, worship you, honor you, adore you, and live every moment for you in the power of your spirit that enables us to do so. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, open the mics, keep the conversation going. I love that you've got a love for Rachel. She's dear to my heart because of my name. <laughs> so, and it's interesting that she is considered, you know, highly respected in Jewish um, circles because she is one of the, the four that gave birth to the tribes of Israel, and she is one of the respected spiritual mamas of the Jewish nation. So she gets a good place. It's a good Jewish name. <laughs> it means little lamb of God. I love that. That's a year of And I love that. But mm -hmm. um, open your mics. You. Um, comments, questions, 